योगेन चित्तस्य पदेन वाचाम शरीर से वैद्यकन योगपाकृत प्रवरम मुनीना पतंजलि प्राजलिरान तोस्मी स्तुवे पतंजलि व्यास शंकर मुनीय कर्तसूत्र से भाष्य क्रमण से You will remember that uh, during the last few sessions, we were discussing some of the uh, definitions given in the early sutras of Samadhi Pada, which constitute some kind of an introduction to the entire psychology and philosophy of yoga. Yoga is defined in the second sutra, that is Yoga ka Chitta Vritti Nirodha. Yoga is nothing but transcending the Vrittis, cessation of the Vrittis. And then in the uh, succeeding sutras, we discussed how Padajali defines Chittam, that is our mental world, the whole mechanism of our mind, memories, our sense of ego, sense of remembrance, all together can be called chittam, the, me- the mechanism of human mind. And uh, it's defined. And then vrittis are defined. Vrittis are fivefold. And in then in the last sutra that we discussed in the last session, Abhyasa Vairagya Abhyam Tad Nirodha How to uh, uh, attain the cessation of vrittis. So these sutras constitute some kind of an informal introduction. Though they, they are found in the uh, Samadhi Bada, but still in terms of our spiritual practice, Samadhi is the third stage. Sadhana is the first stage. Vibhudi is the second stage. Samadhi is the third stage. And Kaivalyam or liberation, emancipation is the fourth and the last stage. Now in the printed books, as I mentioned many times earlier, these chapters are arranged differently. First we have this Samadhi Bada. Then we have Sadhana Pada, then we have Vibhudi Pada, and then Kaivalya Pada. But uh, 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 the way I'm going to discuss, uh, I, I'm going to change the order. So after finishing uh, the introductory portions contained in Samadhi Pada, we are now beginning with Sadhana Pada. Sadhana means practice. You know what, that's the first stage. We practice something, we do some, we practice some spiritual disciplines and then we get the results which could be Bhudipada and the highest result before spiritual liberation, Kaivalya, Moksha, liberation is concentration of Samadhi. That comes the third and last of course Kaivalya. I mean liberation. So this is how we are going to uh, discuss this uh, Patanjali system. So now we will begin with the first Sutra of Sadhana Pada. So now those of you who have got a text, you can refer to that. The first Sutra is Tapaswadhyaya Isharat Pranidhananani Kriya Yoga. So Kriya Yoga is a technical term used here. Remember, Kriya Yoga, according to Padanjali, uh, is different from many of the popular uh, names that you hear these days. Padanjali's Kriya Yoga consists of self-control, self-restraint, self-study and self-surrender. In, in, this is the elementary, the primary transition. Now we will discuss what is Tapa. Well, in, in Indian philosophy in general, Tapa is called uh, uh, 
ascetic practices you may in english we may call ascetic practices so for example uh, you, you on certain occasions or species occasions we will observe certain vows fasting long prayers it also involves some kind of um, self restraint but uh, vyasa uh, with a deep spiritual insight he is very quick to emphasize one point and he says this ascetic practices should not be done in such a way that the serenity of the mind is disturbed so said the i mean it should be practiced in such a manner that our mind remains serene undisturbed calm and quiet so over asceticism is taboo in yoga that is a very important point remember self torture i mean any kind of extreme ascetic practices fasting for many days or uh, practicing certain disciplines which uh, in some ways uh, torments our mind and body vyasa says that is not correct that is that is not the right way so vyasa in vyasa's own words tatcha i mean this tapa chitta prasadanam abadhamanam asevyam tapa that is the means chitta prasadanam abadhamanam i mean it should not disturb or affect or in any way um reduce our inner tranquility and peace so if you fast your fasting should be undertaken in such a way that it only serves one purpose you are able to uh, restrain uh, maybe a uh, gluttony so to speak people who suffer from extreme love for food to the point of uh, that to the point that it becomes a, a stumbling block in spiritual life then it is very good it is a good practice to do some fasting and also when our physical energy exceeds our mental energy then also physical ascetic practices like fasting or um, uh, you can find this in all religious traditions going around the sacred place there are these are these practices you find in both christianity and also in hinduism going around a place of pilgrimage there are places in europe where uh, in uh, right from the medieval times in the catholic mystical tradition they used to practice different kinds of asceticism and which is of course very common in india and also it is very much common in buddhism and in many other religious traditions of uh, the east you find but uh, it is very much emphasized by vyasa the commentator that the only purpose of asceticism is to keep our physical energy and mental energy in balance if our physical energy exceeds uh, the ability of the mind to control it then what happens you know it leads to uh, restlessness physical restlessness it's a very important point to remember if the physical energy exceeds the ability of the mind to control it on the other hand if mind um, uh, concentrates only on speculative ideas and they and without undertaking any discipline any ascetic practices of the spiritual level if you just go on reading books or writing books and then we may uh, we may delude ourselves into thinking that we have really experienced what we are reading that is some kind of a deception if you read a book on samadhi and then you think you have reached that samadhi it is only an idea it's a grand example so it could happen both ways so there should be a proper balance between physical and mental uh, tapa 
So the classical definition of tapa is manasascha indriyanamcha kaikangriyam paramam tapa. I mean this concentration of mind and intellect and the senses on one point that is tapa. So it is this tapa that actually enables us to sharpen our mind. And it is, uh, it is a spiritual practice that gives us the ability to see deeper into anything. Either if you are a scientist, you have to practice asceticism. If, you, if a person becomes extremely obsessed with luxuries and luxurious food, that person may not be able to become a great scientist in the sense you cannot become a great investigator into truth because science also is an investigation into higher truths. Nature reveals its uh, secrets uh, in direct proportion to the uh, intense effort, the intensity of our effort. Well, yeah, you know, in modern times, you know, the paradigm has shifted when you have put everything in a computer or some kind of a make a electronic gadget, then you need not retain things on your head. So you can get something and put everything in a tiny uh, instrument and then you can get, you can depend upon that instrument um, uh, to recollect what you have studied earlier. So maybe the ideal of tapas may uh, have undergone some kind of a change as the paradigm has shifted. But compare a modern uh, scientist working with all the uh, ultra-modern electronic gadgets. You compare such a person with somebody like Ptolemy or uh, let's say even Newton who is not a very, is close to our own times, uh, maybe just about 300 years. So just think of that. The in intensity of mental effort, the sharpness of the mind, the ability to focus on one idea which gives us an insight to higher things. This is true in philosophy also of course, in philosophy, art, anything where all the forces of mind and the senses are focused on one point, then mind becomes a very wonderful, uh, sublime instrument and it can pierce through anything. So that's, that gives us the power, the ability to understand things, uh, to see deeper into things. So that is called tapa, ascetic practices. Vyasa and uh, a commentator who wrote uh, this Yoga Bhashya Vartigam uh, on Vyasa Bhashya, on Tadanjali Yoga Sutras. It is, his name was Vijnana Bhikshu. There are two Vijnana Bhikshus you hear, you read about in Indian philosophical tradition. One was an earlier Vijnana Bhikshu, the same name, he was a Buddhist. The Vijnana Bhikshu who we are talking about was of course, uh, was a traditional author of Shindu. And he was a great devotee. So when I shall uh, explain his own interpretation of Ishwara Panithana, he talks about Prabhati, self-surrendered, God's will. He talks about the highest Karma Yoga. He talks about Bhakti and all that. So you find in the Vijnana Bhikshu's Yoga Bhashivartika. So this is the first aspect of Kriya Yoga. That's important to remember. So Kriya Yoga is a it's a very elaborate, very scientific uh, and uh, very, very technical term used in the Patanjali Yoga Sutra. In, in plain English, in the simplest possible language we can say, if, we are, if you are working in an office, if you are a farmer or a scientist or a doctor or an engineer in modern times in the first century, you can enter the path of yoga. And that entrance is called Kriya Yoga for anyone. Or if you are, even if you are a saint sitting under a tree in the forest, then also Kriya Yoga. Because Kriya Yoga involves Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, selfless activity, and also the art of uh, uh, transforming our physical energy into spiritual energy. This may sound a bit abstract. For example, suppose a person has plenty of 
physical energy, very dynamic, very active by nature and by temperament. Now that person can divert his natural tendency to be active, whatever he does. He can turn that field of activity into something sublime by infusing the element of uh, unselfishness and dedication and a sense of sanctity and sacredness into whatever he does. Then you are practicing Kriya Yoga. So you need not go to a temple or a church and pray and prostrate and surrender to God. No, nothing of the kind. That's very interesting. Of course, that is also mentioned here. Ishwara Pranidhanam is actually is defined by Vijnana Bhikshu as uh, surrender to God. Complete resignation to God. His language almost closely resembles the language of the Bhakti, the devotional philosophers of India, like Vallabha, Nibbarka, Chaitanya and others, which we are going to discuss when we discuss Ishwara Panithana. So this is Kriya Yoga. So how scientific and how psychologically very rational. Anyone can enter the path of yoga by practicing this Kriya Yoga. And of course the simplest trans uh, explanation is Swadhyaya Pranavadi Pavitranam Japa Moksha Shastra Adhyayanam Swadhyaya means uh, reading scriptures, reciting some sacred symbols. It can be done by anyone. Kriya Yoga in its Karma Yoga aspect can be practiced by anyone. Swadhyaya as a spiritual devotional practice can be done by any person belonging to any religious tradition. So there he says, of course, uh, of course, in the classical uh, atmosphere of India's spiritual tradition, you find is mentioned, you know, pranavadi uh, pavitranam japaha means when you we chant pranava, I mean om, the omkara, which is, so it is considered to be swadhyaya itself. Or reading books, moksha shastra adhyayanam, that means, adhyayanam means studying, self-study. Or maybe study under anybody else also. So Moksha Shastram here means any book or any branch of learning that talks about higher life, that eventually opens the door to our higher spiritual evolution. That is Moksha Shastram. It could be Bible for Christians, all the mystical works. It could be Vedas, Bhagavad Gita and so on for the Hindus. It could be um, the Torah, Talmud of the religious uh, texts of the Jews for the Jewish tradition. It could be, uh, uh, you know, these Buddhist practice, this, um, uh, they have this uh, prayer wheel, they chant certain sacred word symbols. That is, uh, that could be called Swatyaya. Or even if you do some if you chant some psalms, it could be Swadhyaya. Because these practices, what happens, you know, these practices will have an impact on our mind. And as we do more and more of these practices, more and more new uh, spiritual energy, uh, express, ener ener spiritual energies, manifestations of energy are create in the mental system and that will have an effect in our life and mind begins to change and evolve. How do we feel this change happening in the mind? The first sign that mind is changing is we feel a kind of tranquility and again we feel less disturbance and less inner conflict when we try to practice spiritual disciplines, if you go and sit somewhere to think of higher things in a calm, quiet atmosphere, if your mind is still very violent, very turbulent, 
That means your mind is not ready to agree with you when you meditate. You want to meditate, but mind doesn't want you to meditate. So mind becomes a stumbling block. So that's because of the negative samskaras, what we call negativity in modern, you can call it in some psychology, school psychology. Uh, remember, so what happens, you know? It's no use telling, well, let us be positive, let us do everything. That kind of self-imposed thing, mind, it doesn't have any lasting effect. There's a trend in modern times. Let us think of everything wonderful. That way nothing becomes really wonderful. Because what our mind is, not just what we do now, it also consists of tendencies and impressions which are, which are deposited in the mental system not in this life, but in previous life cycles. That's why we feel the conflict. So this is an important point to remember. That's why Swadhyaya is mentioned. Now why, now the question arises, why can't we read some novels or stories, thrillers or anything? Why uh, the, the, the uh, commentator, you know, Vyasa, he insists on this Moksha Shastra. Moksha Shastra means any uh, holy book, a uh, holy in the sense that it gives you peace of mind and tranquility and a sense of sanctity and sacredness and meaningfulness and inner relevance of life. That's Moksha, Moksha Shastra. Now only when we think of something higher, some kind of higher life, higher than life at the, sen the sensory level. Then only we will be able to control the senses. See, we, will be able to foc we should be able to focus on something higher, higher than the senses. Then only we will be able to restrain the senses. To be able to restrain our senses, we should be able to focus on something that is higher than the senses. And Moksha Shastras, any religious tradition, these Moksha Shastras are available in all traditions. And also even in agnostic traditions, these are available. Of course, in, a, in, a, in the conventional sense, Buddhism is an agnostic religion. It doesn't affirm the existence of a creator God. Thank God in many ways. You know. But the point is that Buddhism is so rich in these higher books, if you get, uh, you may read Dhammapada, you may read any of these uh, um, uh, Vinaya Pedaga, Sutta Pedaga, Bhidama Pedaga, any of these Buddha's teaching, Buddha's parable, Jataka tales, all constitute some interesting examples of this higher reading that can serve the purpose of Swadhyaya. That is the second aspect. There is an interesting verse, you know, how, how, the how to select the right kind of book for reading. So this is Loka. Anandaparam kiradha shabda shastram sulpam tadayu bhagavascha vignaha yat sarabhudam tad ubasidavyam khamso yatha kshira mivam misram. It's a very interesting uh, verse in ancient. It is also quoted by some yoga, yoga philosophers in their commentaries. Anandapara means the number of books is so mind-folding. So many titles, so many books, it's a huge forest. Now, and sometimes they can, it's very difficult to select the right kind of books. And our lifespan is limited. I mean, our, our lifespan is limited. And also there are many obstacles. Bhagavastya Vigna means there are so many obstacles. Procrastinations postponement, our own laziness. We already discussed this, you know, now nine antarayas. Illness, negativity, self-doubt, feeling of not moving, any, not, not making any progress, getting stuck somewhere, delusions, hallucinations. Sometimes without making any progress, we may delude ourselves into thinking that we have made a great progress. Sometimes even after making a lot of progress, we may still become skeptical. 
These are some of the problems that people may have to encounter when they take to spiritual life. So these are all problems. So how to select the right kind of book? So that's why I mentioned really any book, any work that gives us a kind of inner tranquility, peace and contentment. It's called Kritagritya and Kritarthada, inner contentment. So this, the poet uh, uses a metaphor, a swan. It is believed in mythology. I don't know how far this is true physically, in the physical sense. A swan will be if you mix water and milk and put in a pot. The swan will be able to drink milk and avoid drinking water. It, it has a filtering mechanism in his body, God knows, I don't know, that it can, it can filter out water and drink milk alone. It can avoid milk and drink, sorry, it can avoid water and drink milk alone. It can select milk and drink and avoid drinking water. If you put a, a, a bowl full of uh, water and milk mixed together, a mixture of water and milk, if you place in front of a swan, this bird, the bird can uh, exclude water and drink milk alone. Like that, we should be able to select the right kind of book. I mean, any, any kind of book that creates conflicts, memories, are to be avoided. I mean, is there are books which can uh, disturb our meditation, disturb even normal life by um, by projecting uh, uh, you know false or negative unpleasant images and impressions. Such sources of ideas should be avoided. That's the idea behind. So Vyasa, the, Vyasa, the great Vyasa, the commentator. He makes some very interesting observation in his commentary. It's a very interesting, you know, I'm, 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 I'm making special effort to bringing the words of the original commentators uh, with the one important purpose. First of all, when we say many of the translations, which don't always do full justice the original, uh, teachings of yoga. This aspect is totally neglected. So yoga is often presented as some kind of a uh, God negating, a atheistic at worst, agnostic at the best way of life and philosophy of life. But uh, the commentators give a totally different picture. So Vyasa for example says, you know, Na tapasvino yoga siddhyati anadi karma klesha vasana chitra pratyubasthita vishaya jala cham asud nirantarena tapas sambheda mapadyade idi tapasa upadanam. So this is Vyasa's own words. Now Vyasa says anadi karma klesha vasana chitra pratyubasthita vishaya jala cha asuddhi. So our mind is full of all kinds of thought currents, ideas and feelings and emotions and all so on. I give this example. We can dictate this. When we try to do something good, something noble, something not what not very practical in the sense, you know, normally we will be able to do every, anything which brings an immediate, practical, visible results. That's very easy to do. You do something, you can see an immediate, practical benefit. Easy to do. But very difficult to do something which we are not sure will produce an immediate, beneficial result. Mind doesn't always um, feel very enthusiastic about it. Mind, uh, as, it, as I mentioned, it, uh, it doesn't always cooperate. It becomes hostile. The moment we try to think of doing something noble, something good, 
you can easily understand you will tomorrow you can you try to meditate one day you may feel but if you try to make it a habit immediately conflicting thoughts current will come where do they come from why we cannot always do what we want to do this this is everyone's experience if you could always do what we want to do there be very few problems in the world everyone every student wants to work hard and he knows that he has to work hard to get a good result but he is not able to do in spite of his best desire intention that's because well you have examination you have something else to do but in front of us there are well if you sit in a room let us say with number of magazines pictures books and many things in which in which direction does our mind naturally flow nobody is observing we are completely within our own jurisdiction nobody is controlling nobody is supervising us we know nobody is observing what do we do what we select for reading what we do that will indicate our true culture true samskaras means impressions and frequently for many people mind does incorporate when they want to do something noble when they want to meditate when they want to read something sublime mind creates a hindrance so vyasa says you know anadi karma klesha vasana chitra means all these karmas the previous life cycles we have done karmas actions they produce the vasanas and they are mixed and visheshala they are all moving about moving around with their own obsession for sensory objects so they create these stumbling blocks cha ashuddhi means it is of course in old language in impurity it is called in modern psychology you don't use the word impurity you use the word more high sounding words so that we can pat on our own back we should negativity we may say if you want it that's part but vyasa uses vyasa being an old saint he uses a lived who lived for 4000 years ago he uses the word cha ashuddhi means impurity and it if if our mind doesn't agree with what you are doing if mind uh, turns hostile when you try to do something noble then it's that because there is a should this impurity in some of the samskaras so nandarena tapa sambhedam apadyate without tapa without uh, uh, some kind of austerity you cannot get rid of this impurity that's one advantage of austerity you know see for example um, a greedy man wants to get away from greed if he takes to charitable activities you find only complete transformation people who have amassed huge amounts of wealth during the early years many great captains of industry when they get old suddenly they feel like doing something good for others good for the rest of the world and they start trust in foundations you know why they do that by doing this they are getting rid of this ashuddhi this mental the impurities of samskaras that's why vyasa says you know visheshala ashuddhi this impurities they are getting rid of and when mental impurities are gone to that extent we feel oh i have done something fine i have done something sublime and you feel a kind of inner tranquility and peace so that's why vyasa says without ascetic practice of tapa it is impossible to get rid of impurities of mind that that's why i mentioned earlier tatcha chitta prasa chitta prasadanam abadhamanam anena asevyam but again it's important one should not over emphasize extreme ascetic practices because that may suddenly change the balance of mind then you know the purpose of ascetic practices is to transcend the physical not to fight against the physical 
we should not fight with ourselves we should be able to transcend the physical we should not fight with the physical we should not antagonize the physical but we should be able to go beyond the physical that's the idea thank you but the greatest enemy of this kriya yoga uh, especially tapa is our extreme ideal of uh, this pragmatism raw pragmatism see because the moment you take the yoga if you keep asking yourself the question what am i going what way i'm going to be benefited by this well one should be able to avoid these questions one should be able to go beyond these questions in order to practice yoga so that's why uh, uh, in one context of course you know vijnana bhikshu says arurukshor mune yogam karma karana muchyade yoga rudasya ta seva shamak karana muchyade this from bhagavad gita this shloka from bhagavad gita is quoted by vijnana bhikshu when he wrote this super commentary on vyasa's commentary on patanjali yoga sutras vigyana bhikshu quotes from Bhag- bhagavad gita and also bhagavata purana he was and you find many of his ideas closely resemble the teachings of the devotional philosophers of india like narada shantilya ramanuja nimbarka vallabha chaitanya and so on. so that's what he says you know those who are desirous of practicing yoga for them those who are beginning that is those who are about to practice uh, kriya yoga they should act how they should act without any selfish motive and without any any attachment mentally offering the fruits of their labor the results of their work to god but those who already attained some stage in yoga practices for them they can practice self restraint but a beginner should practice karma yoga and also when we you know tapas swadhyaya ishar panidhana we are talking about ishar panidhana that is self surrender to god ವಿಜ್ಞಾನ ಭಿಕ್ಷು ಸೀಸ್ ಯತ್ ಕರೋಷಿ ಯತ್ ಅಸ್ನಾಸಿ ಯತ್ ಜಿಗೋಷಿ ದಾಸಿ ಯತ್ ಯತ್ ತಪಸ್ಸಿ ಕ ಉದ್ದೇಯ ತತ್ ಕುರುಷ ಮದ ಪಣಂ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ದಿ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ದಿ ಥೀಸಿಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಸರೆಂಡರ್ ವಾಟ್ ಎವರ್ ಐ ಡೂ ಇವನ್ ವಾಟ್ ಎವರ್ ಐ ಈಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಎವರ್ ರಿಚುವಲ್ಸ್ ಐ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟೀಸ್ ಯಜ್ಞ ಯಜ್ಞ ಎಕ್ಸೆಟ್ರ when i do charity when i do meditation mentally do all this offering act the action and also their result to god it's called prapatti sharanagati and he uh, see ಕರೋದಿ ಯುದ್ಧ ಸಗಲಂ ಪರಸ್ಮೈ ನಾರಾಯಣ ಏದಿ ಸಮರ್ಪಯಾಮಿ ದಟ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಹಿ ಸೇಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಯು ಫೈಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಸಮ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ವರ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಯು ಫೈಂಡ್ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಭಾಗವತ ಪುರಾಣ ವಾಟ್ ಎವರ್ ವಿ ಡೂ ಎವ್ರಿ ಥಿಂಗ್ ದ ನೇಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಕರ್ಮಫಲ ನಾಮ ಈಶ್ವರು ಭೋಕ್ತ ಇದು ಚಿಂತನ ಕರ್ಮಫಲ ಸನ್ಯಾಸ ದಿಸ್ ಓರ್ ಡೆಫಿನೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಈಶ್ವರ ಪುನಿಧಾನ ಬೈ ವಿಜ್ಞಾನ ಭಿಕ್ಷು ಐ ಎಮ್ ಐ ಎಮ್ ಕೋಟಿಂಗ್ ದಿ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಸಮ್ ಡೇಸ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ವೆನ್ while reading with the while discussing yoga maybe in in two sessions earlier i mean in the second or third session somebody raised this question about ishara in yoga so i try to explain this uh, ishara has a place in yoga but uh, yoga's earlier philosophical um, legacy goes to sankhya philosophy sankhya has got two aspects one is swesara sankhya sankhya philosophy of later times which accepts god and the earlier version of sankhya which says which doesn't uh, accept the creator god this idea behind 
So, uh, these three disciplines constitute the entrance, the door to spiritual life. When we are talking about Kriya Yoga, as it's, we are not talking about yoga alone. These three disciplines, ascetic practices, Swadhyaya, and of course, self-surrender, surrender to God. These three disciplines, uh, they, co they constitute what we call Kriya Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, all are included here. Now if you have got anything more to ask, we can clarify uh, during the question and the session. Okay. No. Next, next Sutra is, uh, yeah. Next Sutra is very, very, very important. Samadhi Bhava Nartha. Klesha Tanu Karnascha. So that is something. So, to bring about Samadhi, you know, what we should do? We should do spiritual practices with weakened kleshas. Kleshas, I mentioned earlier, afflictions. Kleshas will be defined in the next sutra. So these sutras are interrelated sometimes. One sutra comes and then you understand the true implications of that sutra only in the succeeding sutra. So, this, this, next, so, next one is this, that is Samadhi Bhavanartha. What is Samadhi? In order to bring about Samadhi and for the attenuation of the, for the weakening, the less afflictive, some, I mean to, to weaken the kleshas, that is the purpose. We will take up this sutra after we discuss the third sutra. So you understand the meaning of the second sutra more clearly when you first learn the third sutra. The third sutra explains kleshas because the second sutra talks about bringing about samadhi for weakening of kleshas. And what are kleshas? Avidya, Asmita, Raghudesha, Abhinivesha, Klesha. It's the third sutra. What are kleshas? Avidya, ignorance, asmida, egoity or individuality, and then attachment, raga, aversion, dvesha, clinging to life. These are the five kleshas. Now, what is clinging to life? That can be very confusing for those who don't go through the traditional commentators. Clinging to life actually is, it, in actual practice, it expresses as some kind of an irrational fear of death. That is the, that's how clinging to life becomes one of the classes. Because if you don't get a clear implication of this sutra, people could misunderstand, you know. I mean, clinging to life is some kind of a problem. It is something to be avoided, something to be got rid of. No. All fears, all concerns, especially all irrational fears, irrational, meaningless, totally meaningless concerns, anxieties, and worries, which frequently affect our mind and disturb our mind without any justification. All these are indirectly linked to the idea that death is something unpleasant, scary and fearful. One should prolong it as far as possible. One should strive to live for 100 years, 120 years. That's wonderful. But uh, when the obsession, when the fear becomes some kind of an obsessive psychosis, that can create many kinds of peculiarities in the mental system. Many obsessions, phobias are all linked to this in a way. So that is technique, technically called abhinivesha. 
So we shall try to explain one after another. So this is more and more, most difficult to understand. Why clinging to life, apinivesha, is called a klesha, which is something to be something that should be weakened according to the second sutra. What it means is we should not ever imagine that this physical body is the only thing to be cared for. Or we should not ever imagine that this physical identity is the only identity that we have got. The true I is far greater than my physical body. Once we realize this, then we can weaken this apinivesha, this irrational fear, concern and anxiety about death. For example, people who become extremely attached to one's, his body or her body, for example, let's say, the slightest physical problem uh, creates extreme fear. This could happen, in fact, this is happening right now in today's world. This, this coronavirus, has, uh, it, it has a psychological dimension also. Irrational fears, irrational concerns, absolutely unjustified anxieties, deep and, and to consequent depression, it has become a problem. Not that we should neglect the problem, we should address the problem. We should do all, uh, we should, all that's possible for us, using all possible means at our disposal to address this problem and uh, to keep ourselves healthy and strong and happy, no doubt about it, that's very important. But actually, but when it becomes an extreme obsession to the point of uh, being anxious all the time about our health, then it actually is, will become a problem for the health. It will affect the head. So that kind of obsessive attachment is called apinivesha. And the two other problems mentioned before, raga and dvesha, they are also, raga means extreme attachment. That is also, when we get extremely attached to something in a very irrational way, it is raga and when we become extremely averse to something, hostile to something, with a strong negative attitude to something, which is totally irrational, then it becomes dvesha. So remember, many of these things are common for everyone. Extreme concern for health is perfectly okay, very normal and very healthy also. And you should have some uh, liking for something higher, noble, wonderful. That is very important, that is very much necessary. The Yoga Sutra itself mentions that you should have uh, attachment to a higher ideal, which is very important at the beginning of everyone's spiritual life. We should have some higher ideal and we should identify ourselves with that higher ideal. And we should try to keep away from things that become, that could become problematic. So, Dvesha, all these in the normal aspects is perfectly okay. They become problems, they become clashes affecting our lives, creating totally irrational feelings and emotions. Then they become clashes. Those clashes become problematic. So that we will discuss in the next session. Now we can discuss the subject. If you have got questions, most welcome. I can hear you. Must do it. Very good. Um, I know that many of the classical commentators uh, focused on uh, the characterization of the commitment to Mishwara. And I'm wondering for our context on an English approach to the, the word uh, Pranadana. 
ईश्वर प्रीतान Yeah, you know, this is, uh, there is of course a problem, uh, the problem of syntax and, you know, language and culture, they frequently become problematic, you know. The, the, when you talk about surrendering to God, in a Sanskrit equivalent, in Indian tradition, it may not have exactly the same connotation or implication as we have when we use this English translation. So, Panidhanam here in, in the normal Sanskrit tradition means accepting God as one's great refuge. That's an aspect. The surrendering idea is mentally offering one's actions and the results to God. Uh, that uh, there is no, 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 you know, a spiritual seeker becoming a slave and God becoming a master is totally alien to yoga, Vedanta tradition. But that's not at all the implication. Translation can, of course, create that implication. That's because of some of similar ideas in some of the um, uh, religions of Brahmic tradition. That problem is there, you know. So immediately we will try to understand this idea in the context of what we are familiar with. Uh, well, but when you but when you read the the, the writings of the medieval Christian mystics, you find. They were, did, not, did not feel miserable because they have surrendered to Jesus. If you read the biotobacal writings, rather they, they were always enjoying that. So that's something very interesting, that enjoyment, the feeling of, we call Sanskrit Ananda, feeling, the feeling of inner joy and enjoyment when you surrender your actions to God. There is no, uh, no, there is not that kind of surrender as we understand in modern ordinary language. You give up everything and you become a pauper, not at all. You become richer when you look upon God as your friend, as the refuge. That is the idea that you find in the, uh, in the mystical traditions of uh, the Abrahamic heritage. So also in Hindu tradition. So of course that English translation can produce this effect. You, you got everything taken. So God is sitting somewhere in a throne, he's a big master and boss. And we are all sitting below on the ground at his, not in that sense, that at all. So that's an idea behind Isha Panithana, that's a very good idea. I, that, I mean, I did not want to lead your response. Yeah. But clearly what I was getting at was that for our, at least for the last 200 years, uh, the attraction of, for example, of, the, of Max Muller and uh, to yeah. Brahma Samaj was the idea that, that it was more a matter of commitment than a matter of, yeah. of uh, focused meditation yeah. rather than an, uh, slavish surrender. Yeah, so yeah. It seems like yeah, the okay. like answer yeah. clarified that. Yeah. Th th thank you. Thank you for that point. It's very clear. You know, Western intellectuals, highly enlightened Western intellectuals, philosophers, Indologists, mostly European Indologists, later some Indologists in America also, they took to Vedanta and the higher, especially Advaita Vedanta of India, because it is a sublime, it doesn't ask you to forfeit your own freedom and uh, accept God as the boss. Now, yoga also doesn't do that. Yoga here, they recommends this as a means for those who are entering the path of yoga, who are, uh, being aff who are afflicted by many problems. 
So the moment you think God is your all, that takes a heavy burden off our shoulders. That's remember, that is also one of the three aspects. There are people who need that sort of thing, not a Max Muller. A Max Muller or Paul Dewison can be happy with the highest sublime teachings of uh, Vedanta. But uh, there are many, many people all over the world you find uh, who don't have the, the higher philosophical attitude. And they, 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 rather, they would rather live uh, as a, you know, as a, as a, uh, this is a statement, you know, as some kind of a spiritual slave than, a spirit, than as an assertive spiritual seeker. So there are people like that. For them also, some kind of medicine is needed. And yoga gives a medicine to them. Uh, well, you, if you take, if you, uh, um, if you surrender all your action, the results to God, then also you can feel the inner peace. Of course, as you proceed further, you go beyond that. This is a primary school kindergarten. Kriya Yoga constitutes the primary school. Is the entrance, and again, the Ishvara is one of the three aspects. They together, the, these three together constitute Kriya Yoga. But there are people who enter Kriya Yoga through Karma Yoga alone. And there are those who enter Kriya Yoga through Jnana Yoga alone. Ishvara the, the Pravati, self surrender, is the highest uh, spiritual refuge for certain classes of people who may not be ready to wait, work, or practice uh, karma yoga, or practice philosophical inquiry. For them, they want somebody else to take care of all their needs. And yoga actually presents an option for them also. Not Vedanta. Remember, again, always remember, Yoga Sutra we are discussing not because that's the greatest message of Hindu tradition. I want to mention this. Yoga Sutra doesn't present the highest spiritual goal in front of us. But it presents a path that can take us to the highest spiritual goal. This is an important point. Ashtanga Yoga is the central theme of Yoga Sutra. Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi. Samadhi is the last date. That Samadhi itself it only makes you uh, fit for, the, for eventually becoming highest Jnani, getting the highest spiritual enlightenment. But that itself is not the highest spiritual enlightenment. According to Shankaracharya. So Shankaracharya, Shankaracharya says, if you practice all the Kriya Yoga, you know, Tapas, Swadesh, Paridhan, that's how you enter. Then finally, when you read Asampraknyata Samadhi, you find the later towards the Kaivalya Pada and Samadhi Pada, you find Khaya Samadhi. That Samadhi itself will take you to a level your mind when your mind is totally free from all impurities. And when that mind is, when it reaches that stage of puri purification and purity and tranquility, then that mind, if it listens to Vedanta, that mind quickly grasp it. But that itself is not the highest goal. That only makes you to eventually, not immediately, eventually reach the highest goal. So yoga helps you to uh, reach the highest level of mental purity over Chitta Shuddhi in Vedanta. Once you are reached there, then naturally a person will eventually reach the highest spiritual goal. This I remember. Yoga is important because it contains many, many important teachings that we can practice right now in this 21st century. In the midst of all this. And also it, it, it reveals many, many aspects, the mysteries of human mind. That's the uniqueness of yoga. See, uh, why I'm thinking the way I'm thinking? Why I'm behaving the way I'm behaving? Can I change my own destiny? Can I change my own behavior pattern? 
the way I speak? Can I see a different world when the mind changes? So all these you find in yoga. Vedanta doesn't deal with all those details. Patanjali, to be more precise, Vyasa is the one whom we should thank for uh, unraveling this great mystery of human mind. So Yoga Sutra only help you to understand the workings of our mind. But remember, it is not a kind of psychological analysis. It slowly takes you to a higher and higher and more sublime level of uh, consciousness and awareness. That is the greatest Yoga Sutra. Yoga is a dualistic philosophy, remember, it is not Advaita, it is a dualistic philosophy. It is not wrong, it is right. But when you reach its highest goal, then you find you have to go slightly more, you have to travel a little longer distance. That is the way of it. Yeah. 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 Swamiji, can I ask you a question? Ah, most welcome, most welcome. Yeah. So when I'm talking to people who are near death, yeah, yeah. they are very afraid. Yeah. Now it's easier to, when a person is Hindu, it's not yeah. that we can tell them the Atma is eternal. Yeah, yeah. So for the Christian, you know, the same they believe that the soul will, you know, go and join Christ in the end. But, uh, you know, the, the concept of soul is different than our concept of Atma. So I try to tell them that the body is the only thing that is, you know, body is not going to last forever. But your Atma, of course, the soul, is something eternal. So try to, you know, make them realize that they are not the body, but they are this, this inner strength. And so I try to bring in a little bit of our Hindu philosophy into that, but sometimes it's difficult when you deal with a yeah. person who's a Christian or a Muslim. I, I, think, I think it may not help very much if you try to interpret death and the final destiny in Hindu terms when you are addressing the problem of a Christian. The best thing you can do, you talk about Christ, his greatness. He was a great, he was, he, he is the symbol of humanism, mercy, compassion, many of the great qualities that you find that are so much venerated and discussed in details in all the Hindu scriptures. You find in Say Lord Krishna gives a list of uh, what you call Devi Sambhat, the divine or the spiritual qualities of a person. You find all that in Christ. Uh, you know, so you you talk about the great Hindu sages of Puranas and uh, uh, Hindu scriptures. You find all those qualities in Christ. He was no. You should ask them to pray to Christ, and you should you should. Uh, it's not very difficult. If there are many, many wonderful writings uh, which depict the teachings of Jesus and especially the personality of Jesus, his humanism and his compassion. And, uh, and and so, so, that, so what you can do, you can ask them to pray to Christ. I don't think it's a good idea to talk Vedanta to an aged Christian who is about to die who may not be familiar with this, if you tell him you are, uh, you are Atman, you are not this body, it may not mean anything to him. On the other hand, if you tell, so you, have, you, you, you are safe in the hands of Christ, who will be compassionate towards you, pray to him, that will be fine. Immediately you will understand. That is, this is a very important point. You should not impose Vedanta on everybody's head. It, is, it may not be a very wise thing to do, or even uh, it may not be a proper thing to do. I would suggest that you talk to them about the teaching certain parables. You can talk to them. You can even take some uh, parables and teachings from, let us say, uh, St. John of Cross, uh, yeah, St. Teresa of Avila. Many of the mystics, maybe uh, Eckhart may not be the right, uh, uh, right, uh, the right subject for, because Eckhart is very philosophical and a bit Advaitic. So some of the classical devotional uh, persons, the saints, uh, he, the Christian saints, that would be the best thing for it. And pray to Christ. Prayer is everyone can, something everyone can do, he will listen to you. 
instead of talking about you are not a body, you are not a mind. I don't think that would be the right thing. Even for ordinary Hindus who may be coming from non-Vedantic traditions, you know. After how many, uh, what percentage of Hindus are Vedantic? Not a, not a huge percentage. Only those who are... Thank you, Swamiji. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. One question. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, this is more of like I would like your uh, uh, you know correction for me if I have misunderstood, misunderstood something. Yeah. The, the, uh, first of all, I want to make a comment that Ishvara in the Yoga Sutra is not sectarian at all. There is no sectarian uh, definition given in the Ishvara. No, no, no. So, no. The Ishvara is. Uh, we don't want to go through the number of sutras which talk about Ishwar, but it's very clear it is not sectarian. So any particular god of any religion can yeah. be made as Ishwar yeah. of the Yoga Sutras. That's one number point. The second point I want to raise is that Ishwar Pranidhana Dwa or the option is given in the initial yeah. portion of the yeah. meditation. Yeah. You can uh, why Ishwar Pranidhana, Pranidhana or surrender to God also. Yeah. It will lead you to some value and all those things. Yeah. But yeah. at the end, he did not give an option when you say Samadhi Sindhi Ishwar Pranidhana. That yeah. is at the little bit later. Yeah. So the success of the Samadhi or the attainment of perfection of Samadhi is by surrender to Ishwara. There, he did not give an option. Just wanted to make a note. Yeah. Please uh, comment if I have, not, uh, have misunderstood anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the Ishwara, the Ishwara mentioned here, doesn't actually correspond to the uh, monotheistic Ishwara, you know, of you know, Vaishnava tradition, Shakta tradition, Saiva tradition. In, in Yoga Sutra, the Ishwara is a highly evolved person who is a, um, who will, who, who, whose memory will help us in the right direction. So, uh, Yoga Sutra, uh, the, the Ishwara as understood in Yoga Sutra uh, could be interpreted as the same Ishwara mentioned in the Bhagavata Purana and Gita according to some commentators and Vajaspadi is one of them. Vajaspadi is quoting from Bhagavata Purana, he is quoting from Bhagavad Gita and Vyasa also quotes from uh, some scriptures, not Bhagavad Gita. Uh, so that you find some commentators make it out that the Ishara of uh, 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 Yoga Sutra roughly corresponds to the popular Ishara concept of Hindu monotheistic traditions. You know. Shaiva, Shakta, and so on. You know. That's why Bhagavata Purana is Narayana Yedi Samapayi Tat Karodi Sarvam Sagalam Parasmai Narayana Yedi Samapayi That is Vyajaspati. He quotes Vajra Bhagavata Purana. So the point is uh, when we talk about Padanjali Sutra as such, it's difficult to say Padanjali actually uh, meant. The Saguna Sakara Sadvisesha Ishara, uh, when you use the word Ishara, that Ishara can be any highly evolved spiritual concept acceptable to any person any, in any religious tradition. The question arises, you know, when you talk about surrender, somebody from a non Hindu tradition, from somebody from a, an Abrahamic tradition, will immediately detect this problem, surrender, because it is so much emphasized not in Christianity so much, except in, mono, in mysticism, not even Judaism, but in some other traditions. I don't want to mention that there are controversies on this subject. Because surrendering to God, your devotee is one who has surrendered. That idea is not easily acceptable to many well-educated, cultured, intellectual people in the West. That's why the problem arises. So we are addressing the problem from that angle. If you address the problem within the limits of Hindu tradition, then it would be okay to say that Padanjali meant by Ishwara the, very, the same concept of Ishwara as expounded in the Bhagavata. Bhagavad Gita. The Vajaspadi is an example and also, sorry, yeah, Vijnana Bhikshu, sorry, Vijnana Bhikshu is an example. Vajaspadi also similar statements are there. 
ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ವಿವರಣ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಹಿ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಅಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಈಶ್ವರ್ ಆಸ್ ಸಚ್ ಬಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಪದಂಜಲಿ ಮೆಂಟ್ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ ಸೊ ವಾಟ್ ಪದಂಜಲಿ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಮೆನ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದೀಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಿ ಕಮೆಂಟ್ರೀಸ್ ಪದಂಜಲಿ ವೆರಿ ಬ್ರೀಫ್ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಬೋತ್ ಬೋತ್ ವ್ಯೂಸ್ ಆರ್ ಜಸ್ಟಿಫಿಕೇಷನ್ ಇನ್ ಯೋಗ ಸೂತ್ರ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನ್ ದ ಜಸ್ಟಿಫಿಕೇಷನ್ ದಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವ ಗಾಡ್ ಆರ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಆಸ್ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟಡ್ ಬೈ ವೈಷ್ಣವಾಸ್ ಅಪ್ಲಿಕೇಬಲ್ ಟು ಎವ್ರಿ ವನ್ ನಾಟ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಫಾರ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವಾಸ್ ಆರ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಇನ್ ಎ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಲ್ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಸಂಬಡಿ ಹೂಸ್ ಎ ಹೈಲಿ ಇವೋಲ್ಡ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ನಾಟ್ ನೆಸರಿ ಮೊನೋಥಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಪದಂಜಲಿ ಡಿಸ್ ಇನ್ ಅಪಿಯರ್ ಟು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಫೇತ್ ಆರ್ ಎಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟೆಡ್ ಎ ಮೊನೋಥಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಕ್ರಿಯೇಟರ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಆಸ್ ಎ ಸಗುಣ ಕಲ್ಯಾಣ ಗುಣ ನಿಧಿ ರಾಮಾನ ದಾರ್ ಕೈಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಪದಂಜಲಿ ಡಿಂಟ್ ಅಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಬಟ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಕಮೆಂಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಫೋರ್ಟಿ ಡೈಟ್ ಬೋತ್ ವ್ಯೂಸ್ ಆರ್ ರೈಟ್ ದ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ ರೈಸಸ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ಯು ಶುಡ್ ನಾಟ್ ದ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ಗ್ರೌಂಡ್ ದಟ್ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ ಈಸ್ ಸರೌಂಡರ್ ಟು ಗಾಡ್ ಈಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಎ ವೆರಿ ಪ್ಲೆಸೆಂಟ್ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಫಾರ್ ಮೆನಿ ಮಾಡರ್ನ್ ಇಂಟೆಲೆಕ್ಚುವಲ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ವರ್ ದ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಟ್ ದಟ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ಇಸ್ ಎ ವ್ಯಾಲಿಡ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಅಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟಬಲ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಗಾಟ್ ನಾಟ್ ಎ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ರೆಪ್ಯೂಟೇಷನ್ ಇನ್ ಮಾಡರ್ನ್ ಟೈಮ್ಸ್ ಯು ನೋ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಎ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಸಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ no no let us go to another question please wait we 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 should not one we can again we can come anybody else are there question yeah uh, you mentioned the two things about uh, surrendering to god yeah. or not clinging to life overcoming death or even meditation yeah these take different levels of your understanding of that yeah uh, uh, even surrendering to god there is a different level as you uh, listen to lectures and come yeah. Yeah. so my question is what is a good path um, to get rid of the kleshas uh what do you say like, like is it fasting chanting um sometimes even if you do uh, volunteering or selfless work even then it's very hard to get to that state of surrendering to god so is there vyasa or anybody suggest some of the preliminary steps of the good path ye the surrender no the prapatti idea sharanagati idea is more popular in vaishnava tradition it has got a great psychological significance because if you sincerely can believe that god is the one who is behind everything god is only he is the karta and bhokta that's all jnana bhikshu says in yoga bhashya vartika you know in that if you can sincerely believe that you can feel a lot of load heavy burden is taken lifted off your shoulders you can feel that way that could happen that could have if sincerely one can do that one can believe god is everything then uh, the point is we accept this is a great idea but when we try to practice we feel conflict that's because that that surrender has not taken place in reality that if it could happen in reality there be no problem that that's a thing uh if a person can sincerely believe god is behind everything then he won't feel any conflict any any pain or any setback he won't have any anxiety because he has strong believe that god is behind everything but we accept it and we do that but the real mental surrender may not be actually psychologically complete when it is not complete then the conflict continues when it is complete there will be no scope for conflict yeah you know the the uh, the ishvara panidhana is mentioned at the beginning and you know kriya yoga is the step first step towards yoga anyone can do that and see great help karma yoga is a great help bhakti is a great help uh, so also kriya yoga is a great help ishvara pradhana is a great help so that's why it's mentioned as a beginning as an entrance into yoga life thank you guys yeah. next question by from gausaugata and yeah. then jatin yeah. i see two yeah uh hello swami yeah. pranam swami ji yeah. yeah. uh, i have a question and this is a, a, a technical a very simple question so this raga yeah. uh the raga it is if you use if you take the raga yeah. so it, we can say that uh, attachment to yeah. life yeah. is also a raga 
but attachment to life is same as fear of death. So why does uh, Patanjali separately uh, specify fear of death? Because well, it, it comes into Rana himself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, clinging to life was considered to be a problem by Buddhists also. That is also one of the reasons why the Trishna and clinging to life causes this Praditi Samudpada to continued life cycles one after another, birth, death and rebirth and so on. So, uh, most probably it has something to do with the contemporary times of Padanjali. Uh, the idea of uh, clinging to life, some the fear the again clinging to life is to be understood as fear of death. Yes. That is an insult. Clinging to life as such is not considered to be a klesha, but clinging to life uh, interpreted as fear of death becomes a klesha. That's the idea behind. So again, as I mentioned earlier. When it becomes some kind of an obsession, creating unnecessary irrational fears and anxieties uh, without any justification, then only it is called abhinivesha. See, all these aspects, you know, uh, avidya, asmida, raga, dvesha, abhinivesha. Asmida means egoism, egoity. Without self confidence, you cannot take to yoga. So, that's one aspect of ego. But the same thing can become a problem when it's stretched to another level. So there it becomes asmida. So it's called a klesha, to be got rid of. That's the thing. Again, you know, raga, you always, you need a higher ideal. You need, you need to, even without some interest in yoga life or scriptures or higher life, you won't take the trouble to study Yoga Sutra, practice yoga, you won't do that. But at the same time, um, when uh, we become obsessively attached to sensory objects or things like that, then it becomes a klesha, not a normal life. If you have, a, if you have an interest in something, uh, you have to do that. But uh, if that becomes an obsessive problem uh, to the point of disturbing your normal life, then it becomes a clash. So also dvesha, you may not like everything or everyone, but uh, you cannot, there are many things that you would rather not do. It should not be interpreted as a dvesha, as a clash. But aversion towards things can itself become a, 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 a psychological burden. Some kind of an obsession, it becomes a klesha. The kleshas register strongly in our mental system. Uh, it's called karmasya, the repository where all the kleshas samskaras are deposited. It becomes a problem. And these kleshas samskaras will take fruit only in the next life, not necessarily in this life. So all these have a normal human aspect and also uh, another aspect when it becomes a klesha. That is what should be avoided. Tapa is mentioned here. Tapa is mentioned here. But we also say Tapa should not be it's some kind of over asceticism to the point of disturbing the mind and body. Then it becomes a hindrance to yoga. But without Tapa you cannot enter yoga. Same taba when you become excessive over asceticism, torturing the body, your mind, then becomes a, a, a problem. Can, can, uh, can, can, can somebody say that uh, all the other glaciers are part of avidya? Yeah, yeah, you are right, yeah. Actually, avidya is the, avidya is the mother of all glaciers. That's why avidya, asmita, raga, dvesha, abhinivesha. Abhi, av, avidya means error or ignorance. Normally what it means is, you know, technically in the yoga philosophical tradition, which is again linked with Sankhya, we forget our Purusha identity and we 
identify also with the prakriti, the jada prakriti and its values. That is the philosophical explanation. That process, that phenomenon is called ignorance. We mean, we, so we identify also with every passing experience, all that we see around us, that's all. I offer, I, I, want to, I want to remind everyone, you know, yoga is essentially a dualistic system. And uh, yoga is important, yoga shastra, yoga sutras are so important, yoga shastra, so it's a very important because it analyzes the human mind, describes the vrittis and vasanas and samskaras, and all these are fully accepted and uh, 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 accepted as, as right, as the right understanding in Advaita Vedanta. All Indian systems of theistic of Indian philosophy recognize yoga, analysis of human mind, buddhi, samskaras, vasana, all fully accepted. Only yoga conclusion, you know, Purusha and Prakriti are two eternal categories. Uh, that mean Purusha is, is Sachetana and Prakriti is uh, Jata and uh, the entire uh, creative phenomenal world is, is nothing but evolutes, 23 evolutes of Prakriti, Mahatattva, Ahangara, then Satya Ahangara, Tamasiga, Rajasya then the, the Tanmatras and then Pancha Mahabhudas and we identify ourselves with all this. So that uh, permanent uh, distinction between Purusha and Prakriti as two separate entities which again is a legacy of Sankhya in philosophical tradition. So yoga and Sankhya are basically dualistic systems. Dualism doesn't mean two, it means more than one. That is the real meaning of dualism uh, in Vedanta. Shankaracharya himself used the word, you know, uh, the word, you know, so siddhanta vyavasthasu doitino nishchita dhidam. The doitino means in Sankhya, yoga, nyaya, vaisashi, all simple. Oh, oh, please, please, please. Thank you, Dan. Please, please. Uh, this is actually refers to the older question of Ishwara. Yeah, 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 yeah. Please. If, uh, 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 even though the term Narayana was used by a commentator on the Yoga Sutras, yeah. really the Yoga Sutras does not uh, mention, the, mention the term Narayana at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, the definition of Ishwara for the Yoga Sutra um, author is only that she should not be stuck by other people in the samsara. And so, Purve Shamabhi Guru, that means he is a teacher of the older teachers also. Yeah, yeah. Maybe only one problem there is Tasya Vachaka Pranava. Yeah, that yeah. means Pranava yeah. is, Prana is the indicative of, the, of that particular, particular Ishwara. Yeah, yeah. Which is sort of questionable because that may, may be, make it sectarian. Does it make it sectarian then? It doesn't make sectarian. It doesn't make sectarian at all. It doesn't make. You know, when we study Yoga Sutra right now, the one problem is, you know, Padanjali Sutras themselves may not make much sense without Vyasa's commentary. If you look at the chronology of the commentators, can you think of Padanjali without Vyasa, without succeeding commentators? See, even the very concept of Samskara, which actually, Really speaking, it is a unique contribution to modern psychology, unique contribution of yoga psychology. The way samskaras and vasanas or sankalpas interpreted in the yoga system, you won't find that anywhere in modern psychology. What I mean to say, but it's all Vyasa's work. Even the analysis of human mind, shiptam, modam, bhikshiptam, ayakakra, Vyasa's work. Paganjali never mentions that. So, uh, it, the, I mean, this is one view. There was a succession of teachers and students, beginning with Vyasa, and in that land you have got these uh, uh, commentators like uh, Vijnana Bhikshu, who was a devotee, and according to some uh, others, you know, it's very, very speak, uh, debatable. Uh, he was a follower of Nimbarka and Vallava. There is one view we don't know. Um, so, he, you, you can find him emphasizing this Prabhati, Saranagadi ideal of Gita and Bhagavata are 
quoted to emphasize the Ishara ideal of Yoga Sutra. Padanjali probably never dreamt of that. So you can find a long departure from Padanjali's original teachings. But anyway, that is in a worry. But these commentators have enriched Yoga literature, giving uh, more meaning and relevance and extending the dimensions of Yoga system which Patanjali may not have even dreamt of. Mostly the succeeding uh, teachers and students who came in that line of Vyasa have enriched that. So, uh, again, so you can find different, again, different interpretations. Rajamartha and Bhoja gives different interpretations. He was also a devotee. Shankara was, he, he gives an Advedic twist to certain aspects. So, anyway, that's a, that takes us to a different level. So, thank you for all the participation. Most welcome. Thank you. Namaskar. So we shall conclude. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Panamastu Om Shanti Shanti Shanti